Well, good evening. Welcome to the rainy night in Georgia. We ought to make a song about that, hadn't we? But I'm so glad all of you are in God's house tonight. Got a pretty good crowd for Monday night tonight. He keeps me singing. So let's stand and just keep singing about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace, peace, still, in of all life's ebbs and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my ever longing. Keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discard filled my heart with pain. Jesus wept across the broken string. Stirred a stumbling cord again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know fills my ever longing, keeps me singing as I go. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Thank you, and you may be seated. Well, good evening. Y'all have a good Monday? Yeah, that's what I expected. Um, <laughs> not much ever. So I'll ask you again tomorrow and see and see how the response is, okay? All right, well, uh, just as far as announcement goes, just remember we still have revival tomorrow night and Wednesday night at 7 p.m. So y'all come out. If you see some folks that uh, were not here tonight, give them a call or a text message um, or maybe a call if you were here last night and heard what Kenny had to say about text messages. Uh, I found out a lot about that. Um, he always texts me and never calls. But, um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> so give them a call if you see they're not here tonight. Just remind them, remind them they need to be showing up. Also, those envelopes in front of you, those orange envelopes, that's our way of being able to collect the revival offering. Make sure to be praying about how the Lord leads you for that. If there's not one in your pew, there are some back there in the back with the offering plates. Well, that's all we have for announcements tonight. Let's go ahead and look at prayer requests. As you know, we have several in our church that need a special touch from the Lord. Uh, let's remember the family of Lona Dozer. Is that how you say it? Very good. This is Alicia Dunn's grandmother. Now, her grandfather was 95, is 95 years old. They were married for 65 years, and they were together for 67 years. So, wow, what an accomplishment there. So be praying for him as he navigates this time um, without his wife and their whole entire family, for sure. Um, have we, do we know how Lauren's doing? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Let's definitely remember Lauren. He is not doing well. Not a good day today. So be praying for him and for Miss Vicky also. What are some other ones we want to mention by name tonight? All right, if there's none, we'll go to Lord in prayer, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Lord, and even though it's raining outside, we're thanking you for the fact that, that we were able to get here safely and we were able to praise your name this evening. 
And Lord, as we look over this prayer list, we know that there are several in, in connection to our church that has several different issues. And Lord, right now we lift up those that are sick, those that have cancer, Lord, those that have COVID, those that have other health issues. Lord, we ask that you just, just be with them, touch their bodies, Lord, be with the doctors and the nurses as, as they go about and, and take care of them. Lord, we lift up Lauren also this, this evening as he is not looking good, Lord. And, and, and if we look at it from a worldly perspective, we can see that 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 things are not looking good, but Lord, we know that you are still a great physician, the great physician, and that you can heal. And so Lord, right now we ask again that you just touch Lauren's body and that you let him take a turnaround from this. Lord, right now we know there are several others in our church that have other needs right now. Lord, those that are grieving, those that have children and relatives that don't know you. And Lord, we ask that you be with each one of these situations, that you just touch them like never before. Lord, specifically, we lift up this, this family that we talked about today, Lona Dozer, Lord, and the, 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 the fact that they're grieving her. We ask that you just be with them. Lord, tonight as we pray and as we look forward to your Holy Spirit falling on this place, letting us know that you are already here. Lord, we ask that first you open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us this evening. Lord, as Kenny preached, we, we pray uh, this evening that you do not let our soil be hard. Lord, we, we pray this evening that, that you allow us to be receptive to the seeds that you have, that you are going to throw out so that we can grow up and produce the fruit that you have for us to produce. Lord, do not let anyone this, this evening that, that, that is carrying a load that they need to give over to you, anyone that, that, that does not know you fully, anyone that is not drawing close to you, Lord, don't let anyone leave this place, we pray, without giving those things to you, without coming to know you as their personal Lord and Savior, without giving up the things that prevent them from being close to you. Lord, right now we just lift up Reverend Kenny, Lord. Lord, we ask that you just give him the words to say this evening. Lord, that you just allow him to be able to be connected with you. And, and Lord, from, from your mouth to his, just let your words be proclaimed. Lord, we know that we're not here to listen to Kenny this evening. We know that we are here to hear from you. And so, Lord, we just ask that you just use him as a vessel this evening. Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels sing the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his every child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels song. When years of time shall pass away, an earthly throne and kingdom fall. When men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains come god love so sure shall still endure 
I'll measure less and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with the ocean feel and wear the skies a parchment made where every star on earth a quail and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of god above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scrolls contain the whole those stretch from sky to sky. Come on, church. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels song. Oh, the love of God. But there's just something about that name. Jesus. 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 Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after a rain. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord for the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well. Good group out here fought the raindrops. Uh, praise God for that. And uh, I'm thankful to be here. I found a little shorter way to a lap of hall. I didn't know it's possible, but I did. And uh, I ain't going back that way. But anyhow, I'm going to take the longer route. A little too curvy and dark for me. But anyhow, that little sister on my phone told me how to go. And uh, y'all know she ain't always real reliable. She's a little bit like science. Just kidding, just kidding. Sometimes she gets it right, and sometimes she don't. 
I was too hard on science. My wife's a nurse. I'm not trying to, I'm thankful for the doctors and what they know in medicine, but they're ever learning. How many of you know they're just practicing medicine? God's already figured it all out. Amen. Okay. All I'm trying to do is point us a little higher than down here. Aren't you thankful you can look higher than down here? All right. That ain't, they ain't got the last word. Our brother's laying over there on the ventilator, but he has the last word. They're not going to have the last word, all right? And so we, we want to keep that in our focus, and that's all that was last night. I just get a little excited about it sometimes. And so just want to make sure everybody knows I love you. <laughs> I try to stay away from doctors. You know, I do. I'll be honest with you. I try my best not to go to any of them. Uh, I, I don't. It's nothing I have against them, but I'd rather just stay away from them. You know, if you ever get hooked up with them, it seems like you can't get rid of them. Have y'all ever noticed that? You just keep them all the time, and they got something for you and doing something. And so the longer you can stay away from them, the better you are. But if you have to get involved with them, keep your focus on him. He's the one keeping you. Amen? And be thankful for the doctors and nurses that help us. Well, I wanted to get that out for y'all stone me, you know, or whatever. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 7 is your turning. I want to say this to you. This is going to be different. All right. I'm just sharing with you right now. You will not have probably ever been in a service like you're fixing to be in. So I'm just going to share with you right up front the way it is. I'm on what I call assignment from God. This ain't a preaching time. Not really a teaching time. I'm sent by God to talk to you tonight. All right. So you're going to hear, based on the scriptures, some things from heaven. They're meant to affect your life to change. I can't change you. I don't want to know what you'll do with the information. But since COVID, I got back after COVID. You know, when COVID hit, I had to, 14 meetings got moved. You know, everybody started canceling because they couldn't meet together and all that. And I had these full schedules just packed up with them. So they crammed them in the rest of the summer and winter, last winter. And even into this year, I've got them just every nook and corner just about. And I mean, I'm thankful they didn't cancel. They just moved, you know, kind of thing. But the point is, is I got a lot of time to spend with the Lord during that time. And I'm thankful for it over in Alapaha and we, our place was shut down for remodeling, and so there wasn't nothing going on over there, and I got to spend all that time with the Lord. And since coming out of that, every week, every meeting, you come next week to Tifton, one night at least, I'm going to be on assignment from God to talk to the people that are going to be in that service about what He's shown me. Yeah. All right. So tonight's that night here, and it might spill over into my night a little bit, but it's going to be different. And so I trust that you will... Uh, li listen to the Lord. You'll hear me talking, but in a minute when I pray, I want you to ask the Lord to talk to you about what He wants you to see out of what He's showing me. All right? We're going to read a passage of Scripture you're very familiar with. It's in Second Chronicles chapter 7. If you'd like to turn there, they'll have it on the screen for us. Uh, it's a passage of Scripture that if I were to poll churches in America today and ask them to submit a revival verse, one of the verses we're going to read, verse 14, would be far and away uh, the verse that would be submitted most by pastors around this nation. Most of you have heard this verse, read this verse, maybe even have it to memory, all right? But tonight we're going to read it in its proper context. We're not going to take it out of context. We're going to look for it in the context of which God spoke it, all right? Stand with me, if you will. We begin in verse 12 of chapter 7, and here uh, Solomon is dedicating God's temple, all right? Uh, David wanted to build it. God said no to David. He said, but your son will build a temple that will last forever. Unfortunately, David thought it was Solomon, but I can promise you it was King Jesus that was coming from the lineage of David that was going to build one that will last forever, amen? That's the one God had in mind. But nonetheless, here he appears to Solomon, begins to speak to him the night after they dedicate the temple. Now watch this, and God's glory had filled that temple. All right? Listen to what he says. Verse 12, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. He said unto him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place, the temple, to myself for a house of sacrifice. Verse 13. If I, now God's speaking to Solomon, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts, to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people, semicolon. 
Meaning now we're going to continue a sentence that started in 13. All right? Now we're going to start back over at 13 and we'll read through 14 because that's one sentence. All right? God speaking to Solomon says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come here with what you've given me to give your people. I pray I be out of the way, be unseen, be hidden behind the cross and Jesus exalted. Lord, I pray that you'd speak. I've got more to say than they can receive. So I ask you to pick and choose what it should be. Spit it out of my mouth in such a way that it is. Uh, uh, they can understand it. They can embrace it. They can act upon it as it is your word. And may it change our lives. And Father, may every hindrance that would hinder. Lord, we realize you cannot be hindered. But those things that hinder us, I bind them in the authority of Jesus' name. And pray that your spirit help us now and guide us, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. I know most of us realize what a terrible shape our nation's in. I mean, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, I'm 62, and I can tell you, I've never seen things change as fast as they're changing now. And they're not changing for the good spiritually. In fact, I don't see much changing good in the natural realm. But I certainly realize spiritually, we're in a backslidden condition as a nation. We had higher ground as a nation spiritually in, in, in days gone by. From the founding of our nation, even in the, in, in the last uh, hundred years of our nation, we have had higher days. In fact, we've had higher days as a nation spiritually in my lifetime. We used to have influence as a church in America. We used to hold sway in decisions across this land. We had power. Uh, we dictated pretty much what the leaders did and did not do. We had power and persuasion, and, and our leaders followed what the church uh, uh, as a whole said. Today, they look at us as an absolute distraction to what of progress. They look at us as like some quaint, ancient people that hold to some ancient traditions and they don't give a rat's rip what we think about anything. And we hold almost no power or influence at all in the decisions going on in our nation. We're almost impotent. And I can remember a time as a boy, and I grew up right outside of Atlanta. Uh, Marietta used to be a good town. That's just Atlanta now. You know, they do move the Braves Stadium out to Marietta, you know, out there where I live. I think they call it Vinings or something, but it's Marietta. And I, I remember as a boy, I tell you how good the town was, we used to race our cars when I was, but that ain't, <laughs> okay. We'd go out to this farm out at the edge of town and race our cars out there because old dirt road out there flat, you know, nobody bothered the police wouldn't bother. We'd race our cars. Do you know that farm today? has 16 lanes of I-75 traffic on it. You see why I say Marietta used to be a good town? <laughs> it ain't no more. But when I grew up out there, I played every sport you could play. Football, basketball, baseball. I played the youth sports, high school, baseball scholarships as a young man. All these kind of things. So I, I, I played them all. And I can tell you, back then, they would not. I'm talking about high school, youth sports, whatever. They would no way you could practice or play a game, watch this, on Wednesday night. You certainly were going to do it on Sunday, but you couldn't do it on Wednesday night. And the reason you couldn't was the church had youth things that went on down there on Wednesday night, and they wouldn't put up with you practicing ball or playing games on Wednesday night. What do you think of that today? They don't, give a, they don't care what the church does. You tell your kids they're going to be over here practice. And you know what? We've gone along with it. 
Oh, yes, we have. We've gone along with it. Oh, that's ball games over there. It don't matter. We've gone along with that foolishness. And to the place now and time. And by the way, how many of you know, when I was a boy, Chick-fil-A wasn't the only thing not open on Sunday. You know, that's a big deal day, but nothing, nothing open on Sunday. One little store down there, and everybody hated to go down there on Sunday. Or anybody see you down there on Sunday buying nothing? Does anybody in here remember any days like that? Okay. Now, here's the deal. Why did that happen in our land? Why was that going on in our land? It's because the church had power and influence in the community and the decisions that it was making. Do you know what's wrong with the country today? The church no longer has the power or the influence anymore. And unless we get it back, the nation's going down the sewer. It's doing like this. You ever see your water doing like that? In a motorhome every now and then, the suction just don't get right in there. Now, in your house, you don't worry about it as much, but in a motorhome, you do it a lot more because if your gray tank shut, anybody got motorhomes? You know what I'm talking about? You shut that gray tank sometime and the suction gets on it, and you get in that shower, and if you ain't paying attention, you're in ankle deep water before you know it. How many of you hate that? Okay, now I see it. But do you see that stuff circling? America's doing like this right now. And the only answer, the only way out, it's not a political decision in it. It would only happen if the church of Jesus Christ again becomes the church of Jesus Christ in America today. So it lies on us, and if we don't make it, we're going down. Here's one of the problems. We have decided and we think voting is going to solve it. If we spend as much time on our knees in prayer as a group of believers, as we do run in our mouth about which one of them got and who we ought to vote to, what's wrong with this and what's wrong with that one, we wouldn't have this nation in the shape it's in today. But all we do is point fingers, talk about this one, talk about that, and you can't hardly get anybody to pray for. I bet some of you, now, I, 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 see, right here is when some of y'all get nervous. Now watch this. I don't care which side of the political aisle you're on because I'm here as God's representative today and I could care less about your politics because he don't either. But you hear it very clearly. He don't care one thing about your politics. So if you sit here and that makes you, rubs you wrong, you need to repent, get your focus right because your focus is wrong. One of the problems in our country today is we're no longer America we're Democrat America and Republican America, and they're fighting for their principles, and neither one of them put the country ahead of their party. Neither one of them. And they're up there fighting and carrying on, and so now what we've got is a Democrat Rep uh, America and a Republican American, and they're fighting one another all the time. And they won't give an inch if it doesn't fit their little philosophy. There was a time in our nation when they could put aside partisan politics and, and come together when there was a calamity, when there was a crisis. And all of a sudden this year, here comes COVID, something that ought to drove this nation together. And all it did was polarize it even further. It exposed the divide. It exposed how divided we are. And Jesus said a nation divided against itself cannot stand. We want to put our heads in the sand and think it's going to get better. It's not going to get better unless the church of Jesus Christ gets better. See, here, here's the problem. And this reason I went to all that. Some of you are more Republican or Democrat than you are Christian. I can hear some of you talk sometimes. I ain't heard it all yet. But if I just stay around you a few minutes, I'd hear one of you in a minute. You're not talking about somebody just started this. I was thinking about this today, and I said, Lord, can I say this to these people, these people? James knows me. He's been a little boy when he, he met me. I met him in a Wesleyan church in North Carolina. They got like three or 400 going there now, don't they? Okay. <laughs> they do. I'll let you know. But anyhow, that's a good number going back in. I don't know how many it was, but it was a good number. You ever think about this? I, mean, I, 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 I know I, this is going to sound rough to you. My pastor's here. He can tell you something different. There's a few more might know me in here. But uh, let me say this to you. I, I, I know what I was when Jesus found me. He got me out of the garbage heap of life. <laughs> he found me. I know what I'll be today without Jesus. Okay? But I want to say something to you because I'm here to want to help. 
I don't want to hurt. I want to help. And you don't know me as well. So I was saying, you know, most of the time you just see Christianity through where you're at and the group of people you're with. And so you're, you're, you're constantly seeing it in, in the eyes of your congregation, the people you're with, and, and, and that's just sort of how it is. I mean, it's the way it is. Me, on the other hand, I'm in a different church every week and have been doing it for nearly a quarter of a century. All right, now I want you to listen to this. And not just Nazarenes. I preach in Nazarenes about a third of the time. The other times I'm in Wesleyan churches. I'm in some Methodists, a few of them. Uh, some Baptists I'm in. A lot of Pentecostals. I deal in a lot of different kinds of denomination. Lives church I was talking about earlier. Uh, independent Methodists, independent Baptists. The Lutherans even had me one time. I can't believe it, but they did. The Catholics hadn't had me yet. But the rest of them have given me a shot one time or the other. All right. And so I'm in big churches, small churches, little churches, country churches. I'm in people's churches that worship for 45 minutes. What do you think of that? I'm in some, they jump for 45 minutes. That would wear me out, I can promise you that. I have learned a little trick when I get in one of them. I just bob my head up and down. They think I'm jumping with them, you know. So you learn to do some things to keep yourself in shape, you know, so you can preach. But anyhow. The reason I'm saying that to you is I've got a different view. There's something to be said for the view of just being amongst your brethren. I told you about my father. 82 years, that brother. I mean, they've been going to the same place. Teaching Sunday school. And that's something to be said for that. The solidness of it. The relationship building. I told him one time, I said, Dad, what in the world are you doing in that Methodist church? Now, the Methodists has held on pretty good as far as officially in their doctrine. They're getting by by the skin of their teeth. I heard some Nazarene tell me, listen to this, high up in the Nazarene church tell me the other day, we're 20 years ahead of them in our decline. Did you hear that? That we're 20 years ahead of the Methodists in our decline. He's talking about in our school systems, I believe. But nonetheless. I asked Dad, I said, what are you still doing in that Methodist church? Because I, I know they're wavering on their beliefs. My father looked at me and he said to me, son, I've invested my life in those people over there. We're going to heaven together over there. We're a body of Christ over there. I know they're shaky on their stuff, but I ain't shaky. And I love them people and they love me. It shut his boy up, I can tell you. I stopped right there. I said, okay, Dad, that sounds pretty good. And I let that go, okay? So there's something to be said for that, but there's also something to be said for somebody that goes around and sees and sees other people and other denominations and all fine kind of things that are going on. And I can tell you, we all got the same problem. We're all in the same mess. Big ones, short ones, fat ones, whatever, how they worship, ever how they don't worship, ever how they dress or don't dress. We're all in the same shape. We've lost influence in our communities, our children, our families, our people. They just tolerate us. They just sort of look at us. We really don't have the power and influence that we once had as a Christian community, locally or nationally. And there's some reasons for it. Let's talk about this passage of Scripture here. God comes to His people. I want you to think about this for a minute. We, I have seen this verse, if my people would you call them, how many of you ever heard that verse before? If my people, okay, most everybody here. You see them on bulletins all the time. But just to take that verse is to miss the meaning of what's being said. I see it on bulletins. I see it on the front marquees of signs. Most of the time when I come in for revival, they'll have it out there. You know, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now, you can tell from my English and my grammar that I didn't pay much attention in high school and college when I was going to English. It's not good. But I do remember this. You can't take part of a sentence and get the full meaning of the sentence, you have to take the whole sentence to get the meaning of the, what's being said. So to take 14 away from 13 would miss the meaning of what's going on. So let's go back and look at 13 and bring it into 14. God says, if I shut up heaven, 
that there would be no rain. What would that be? That'd be a drought. Now, it's not the devil doing it, notice. It's God talking. After his glories fill the temple, he comes to Solomon that night and says, if I cause a drought, or what does he say, if I command the locusts to devour the land, what would that be? That would be a famine. Eat up all the crop. Now, not the devil doing that. God says, if I do that. And then he says, or if I send COVID-19 among my people. COVID-19 is a type of pestilence. But I want you to notice the last phrase. He says, if I send pestilence among who? My people. Now, wait a minute. I want you to listen to this. Here's Israel there. Here's Solomon. And surrounding that nation is a bunch of wicked, godless nations. We're talking idol worshipers. We're talking Jebusites, Hivites. Uh, Gergesites, uh, all Amorites, Moabites, all of these wicked nations that are worshiping idols, all kinds of idols. They're so bad, they're offering their kids in furnaces of fire to these so-called deities. They're doing all this wicked stuff. And he doesn't say anything about sin pestilence among them. He says, if I sin it among my people. Now, why would God send pestilence and drought and famine among his people while all that's going on out there? This would do well for us to get a hold of this. How many of you know that God expects sinners to act the way sinners act? He ain't surprised that sinners do what they do. He's never shocked at that. He's never overwhelmed because Hollywood does what Hollywood does. He's not overwhelmed that the strip joints are going on what's there and the homosexuals are doing that. He's not overwhelmed by that. He's not caught off guard. He knows their hearts depraved. He knows they're lost. He sent Jesus to die for them. Bless God. What he does expect though is that his people who have life, who've been born again, who know the way, who know his word, he expects them to act different than people that are lost and people that are out in the world dying and going to hell. Israel had had the law. God had given it to Moses on Mount Sinai. They'd had the covenants of God. They'd been passed down all this wonderful things from God. They'd seen the miracles of God. They had the tabernacle. They had the temple and all this. And yet they turned their back on God. And God says, hey, I may have to bring the drought. I may have to bring a famine. I may have to send pestilence among you, my people. How does that relate to us? There's never been a nation on this planet had more light of the gospel than America in the United States of America. Man, you look at us. We got a church on every corner. They're on every corner. They're in strip malls. They're everywhere you can go, there's a church. I sometimes count them on the way to the church. When I'm going, I have to drive a little ways in, in a new place. I count the number of churches. And with all those churches out there, how come there's abortion in this land? How come homosexuality is legal in this land? How come our nation is going down the way it is with all these churches out there? We've had light. We've had knowledge. We've had understanding. We've had the blessing of God like no other people. But you know what we've done? We've turned away from that. And we're headed in another direction. And God says, if I shut up heaven, if I bring a drought, if I bring a famine, or if I send the COVID-19 among my people. Let's talk about this for a little bit. This is where it gets ugly. Everybody gets nervous. Everybody starts spitting. Some of you will want to go. Resist. I have a point for this. Let's talk about this COVID-19 for a minute. I, it, I might have heard about it last January or February, but it was March before it really came into my sphere of understanding what's going on. I mean, you know. So somewhere around March, I start hearing about COVID-19. And by the end of March, they're shutting everything down everywhere, okay? So that's that's about my, y'all might have heard about it a little sooner than that, but I, that, that for me, that was my time frame for that. And, I, and since then, and mostly during that time, I was hearing where it came from. You know, and you, you, you'd hear all this stuff, and, and people would be telling you it came from China. In fact, it came from a providence, what is it, uh, Wuhan, 
China, okay? And then you'd hear them say, well, it come from the wet markets. And then you'd hear a bunch say it come out of the laboratory, even to the fact that it might have been intentionally set loose. Now, I'm going to say something here right up front. I don't know, and you don't know where it came from. You have no idea. You have no firsthand knowledge. You don't know anybody that knows where it came from. You don't know anybody that knows anybody that knows where it came from. You have secondhand knowledge. All you're listening to is what come off of TV and they told you. It might have come out of Portugal. Oh, no. You really think the media is trying to get you truth? They're trying to get you answers? You better wake up because the media right now is stealing information from you and it's keeping certain information from you. It's controlling what you get. You better wake up to this. I believe it probably come out of China, but you have no firsthand knowledge it came out of China. I actually believe it was probably set loose on purpose. You don't have to believe that or not. I don't know if it was or not for sure, but I believe that in my... You say, really? You believe them Chinese did it? Well, let me tell you something. If you know history, you know men have done a whole lot more wicked things than that. Read, read about Mao some. Go read about Stalin. How about Hitler? He was marching them by the millions in the concentration camps and shooting them and gassing them and killing them by the millions in the 40s. All right? So I'm just telling you, men have done a whole lot more wicked things than turn a virus loose on the world. China was in economic disaster over there. It, the, the Trump deal was working on China. It was driving them down. And they wanted to get the world even with them. I guess. They sent it out on purpose. Well, if you go look at what they did do, you'll find that they, they shut down that providence. They wouldn't let anybody in that providence in anywhere else in China, but they let them fly out all over the world with that virus. I'm just saying. But let me say this to you. That's my opinion. You can have a different opinion of that. You can say, well, wet markets, it didn't come personally, it might have been whatever. But here's one thing you can't have another opinion on. No matter where it came from, it didn't catch God off guard. How many of you know he know right where it birthed, how it got out, who it came through, what they did? He's not fooled by the media, politicians, or nothing. He knows exactly where it came from. And here's a sobering thought you better come up to face to face with. And he had the power to stop it, but he didn't. Right. Have you thought about why God didn't stop it? Of all the anything going on on this planet, he didn't need a vaccine. He didn't need medical science. He could have just said no. And it'd have been no. But he didn't. Now some people say what God, since he didn't stop it, it must be his will. In fact, some people will tell you anything God allows, God wills. I don't subscribe necessarily to that. And the reason I say that, it's not his will that any should perish, but all should come to eternal life. And we know many are going to perish. The Bible says, broad is the way, wide is the gate. And many they go that go in there at because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. So it's God's not God's will that any should perish. So it's hard for me to see that what God allows God wills in that sense. But I must say, I have to say, that he let the pestilence go without stopping it. That means he has a purpose for it. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. Let's think about that a minute. Why would God do that? What, what could be a purpose for God doing that? Well, let's take lost people. The people all over this planet that do not know Jesus Christ and they're going out into eternity every day without Jesus spending, watch this, an eternity in hell. We recognize that's what the Bible teaches. Okay? They're going out into a place away from God into torment throughout all eternity while the church 
is cutting their grass, mowing their yards, taking care of their cars. They're worried about their kids going to little secular school or whether the bulldogs win or not or their favorite show on TV. While people all around the globe are dying and going to hell and the church in America is busy, busy with its own little agenda, its own little things, its little prayer life about them and their comfort and ease with little or no concern about lost people and where they're headed. Jesus is not coming back to preach anymore. He's left the preaching to the church. The reaching of the loss to the church. It's our responsibility. And what's happened to us is we've got caught up in uh, the temporal natural world and living for that. And the lost are going out into eternity while the church is floundering around in the temporal and the natural. And he needs something to get our attention. He's trying to reach the lost directly with it that maybe they would think about eternal things. They might get nervous. They might get scared. You know, it might turn to looking for answers. He's in high hopes for that happening. But in America, for us, it's to awaken us. So I'm going to ask you a question. And you pay close attention to the answer because God's looking to you to answer Him. You don't answer me. You answer Him. How is your spiritual life since COVID started? Has your prayer life gone up? Has your hunger for God gone up? Has your hurt for the loss gone up? Or has it been about mask? Whether you can go to the store or not, whether you can work or not, whether you're going to get your money or not. What, what, what's the focus? The last revival I had before it shut down it was a Tuesday, and I was, we were having to finish on Wednesday. I was outside of Charlotte. And that Tuesday that everybody was Wednesday, the governor in North Carolina had said you could only have 10 in the meeting. You know? And so that was going to end that revival you know, by that next Sunday. And so they were going to finish Wednesday night and be done. But that Tuesday, my phone rang off the hook. And he, he, here's what it was. He, I, stayed on the, I literally stayed on the phone nine hours. I had to plug my cell phone in to stay there, and I had somebody waiting to call back for nine hours. I had to, the last, I had two more to call the next day. I had to let them go. It was all pastors and district superintendents that I'd known several of them over the years, and they're calling me and they're talking to me about whether or not we should shut down or whether we should continue to meet. And I stayed on the phone listening to these men. Men of God, pastors and others who were in the, caught in this dilemma of whether or not they ought to let the government shut them down or whether they ought to uh, you know, stand up against it and go on to church or whether you know, they ought to uh, you know, uh, keep meeting or whatever the case may be or not meet. And literally, it was about divided down the center. I mean, one half of those preachers, it, was, it seemed like it was every other call to me. Because I was feeling like I was becoming bipolar you know, during the middle of it. you know. But anyhow... It, one side of them was going, man, they're not trying to shut us down for the gospel. They're just worried about this disease uh, uh, running rampant, and they want to slow that down. And the Bible says we're supposed to obey the leaders of our land. And I'm going, yeah, that's right, guy. And I know that's in the word. Yeah, yeah, I hear you like that. Well, the next call guy's going over here. He's going, man, we got to show the nation that we, we got faith, and we ought to stand up in the middle of this trial and have a place of prayer and have a place of community, and we ought to be there and be at, reaching out to the community and saying we're coming together and showing faith. And I'm going, man, that sounds right too. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going on with that. You know, and I'm listening to them talk. And this is going back and forth. And it ran right up in time for me to go to preach. And so I had to go preach and all that. But the next morning when I got up, I got about 4.30, it was a lake, Baden Lakes, not too far from where I was preaching. I knew this little spot down there. And I, I got off of her about 5.30 in the morning, something like that. And I started rebuking devils. I rebuked devils for about 20 minutes because I didn't want any interference between me and Jesus. In fact, they wasn't a devil left on the eastern seaboard when I got through that day. Y'all were all good that Tuesday, I can promise you. But anyhow, I wanted to hear from God because I, I knew something had to go with this. This wasn't, you know, they were both on two sides of the coin here and the good men, good people that I was talking to, I mean, loved the Lord on both sides. 
So I'm trying to say, yeah, you got to help me. So when I finished all that rebuking, I said, God, I got to hear from you. And he spoke to me instantly. Now, I got to tell you, most of the time, it takes me a while to hear from God. I'll be honest. I don't care what the matter is. I, I just don't hear from him just like that when it's a matter or an issue something. Because most of the time, here's the reason. I have some kind of preference about the answer. And preference will always blind you to hear from God. Even if it tells you the thing you want, you won't ever really know if it's God or if it's you. If I agree with me like this, okay? So in order to hear from God, you've got to rid yourself of preference. The only preference is his preference. And when you get to the place that your preference is out of the way, your will, your desire is out of the way, and it's only to do what he wants, you'll hear from God really quickly right there. So most of the time, it takes me a while to get my affections off something or something I really want and to have happen and stuff. And that's about healings and other things. Sometimes God wants you to go through stuff. You may ain't here old enough to tell me, you notice God don't heal everything you go through. He'll heal some stuff. He'll help you through all stuff. But some stuff he just wants to walk with you through. He doesn't deliver you from that's good preaching. Somebody say amen out there, except for old folks. I mean, young people better get ready for this, all right? But God spoke to me instantly, and I heard him because why? My only desire is to help these brethren. And this is what God said. Now, remember, one side saying we ought to meet. The other side saying no meet. And God spoke and said, I don't need another Sunday morning ritual. They were worried about meeting or not, and God was concerned with how they're meeting when they meet. Most people go to church just because they normally go to church. They don't come to church for the right motives, the right reasons. They're not coming in the right spirit. And what's happening is, is that's where the influence is going. That's where the power's going. It's because our gatherings have no power. Some of it is, 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 is because of this reason. Now, this, y'all ain't mad yet? Y'all ain't left? If y'all noticed, I parked my car with the lights headed out. <laughs> I've learned to do that when you preach these kind of stuff because they run you out and you want to get, make a quick getaway. I'm just kidding. If you hadn't left, you're going to leave now, more than likely. I am not, I do, I'm not about to make a distinction without a difference. This is very important to understand. So pay close attention. I'm not wrong. We talk about these structures as the house of God. In fact, we pray, Lord, we're thankful to be in your house. That is totally wrong. It's the wrong way to look at it. The Bible says God does not dwell in temples made by hands. He doesn't dwell in structures. Pay close attention. When God dealt with Israel when, throughout the tabernacle, you'll read about the tabernacle. There it takes a bunch of boring chapters for most of you to read, but it has a lot to do with Jesus. But God literally dwelled there physically, cloud by day, pillar of fire by night amongst Israel. The temple, his glory had filled the temple there. In order to meet with God, they had to go to the tabernacle to a place or they had to go to the temple to a place. They had to bring their sacrifices there. They had to meet a priest there. They had to go to a place, to a building, to a structure. When Jesus came, hallelujah, he rose from the dead, sat at the right hand of God, and you can access him from your bathroom, uh, from your bedroom, from the farm, from the barn, from the car. You don't have to go to a place to access him, you can access him from anywhere. It's a spiritual thing, all right? And then the Bible tells us this, that we became the temple of God. He inhouses us. He's in you. He's in me. And we don't need to come here to worship him. We ought to be worshiping him every day in our temple. And what we've turned church into is the only real place. It's all that we do, Christianity. It's all about worshiping here. We call this the house of worship. You know what this is? This is a meeting house where worshipers come. Woo! That's good preaching right there. 
Now, it'll change your life because you're the temple. The Spirit of God lives within you. You and I are a sanctuary that He indwells, and I'm to worship Him every day. I don't, if we're in a cornfield or a cathedral, it doesn't matter. We're the church, us, not the building, the structure. And what's happening to us is we're, we're using these and we just come in. We just come in and go. We come in and go. It's like we check a box. We check a box. We've done our little devotional. We've read our little Jesus calling. Y'all have that? I'd like to know which one you have. I call yours out. But most free highest preacher reads. I read that. I've read a bunch of these things. But if that's what you call meeting with God, somebody else met with God. Chambers met with God. Sarah Young met with God. God wants to meet with you. He wants to meet with you. He's living within you. And you and I need to realize that He's living within us and our daily life ought to be worshiping Him and our, He's in our temple. And when we come together here, watch this, it isn't really to worship God. You ought to be worshiping God all the time. Pay close attention because this is the problem. We ought to be coming together to worship Him. This is about being together. This is about coming to be with one another. It's about loving on one another as children of God, of worshipers of God. It's to help the hurting. It's to help the broken. It's to work in the lives. Pray for the lost. Get in here together and love together and worship together. I can worship together, worship God all day, every day. Should be because He's in my temple. But this is about coming together. And we're too fractured when we come. We're not really about together. You know, it's coming though. When you read the Bible, time to do a study on this sometime, if the Lord will lead you. But I'm going to pray for him too. Because <laughs> it takes longer than I can say this. The church and God's people has never, ever, ever done well in Temporal natural prosperity. Amen. They've always backslid. That's right. They've always never been what they're supposed to be. It's the entire history of the Old Testament. Amen. Is Israel did well economically and did well in the natural realm, they spiritually plummeted. Amen. Down through the history of the church since the time of Christ, you'll find it that way. But when the church's birth it's birthed under persecution, heavy persecution. These people, these believers are meeting together, buddy. They're hiding in places and they're being persecuted. They've been drug out to prison. They've been put to death. They, they've been fed to lions. They've been crucified. And so the church meeting in, but that was a close-knit thing. They was loving on one another because any day of the week they could all die. You know what I mean? That went on for about 400 years. Hiding out in catacombs and all kinds of things. If you read the history, you'll find this. And here in America, man, the church has been skating, man, sorry. With almost no persecution. Amen. I can tell you right around the corner is heavy persecution for Bible-believing Christians. Amen. See, what this is really about is this. COVID's about what's coming. The second thing the Lord told me that day, not just, I don't need another Sunday morning ritual, is that these things are going to come like waves against the shore. Here come COVID. And behind it's going to come another thing. And another. Right. And here's the main reason why. Part of it has to do with the end times. The Bible talks about it. God told me like way. But the Bible would say these things come like a woman in travail. Now you ladies, help me out if I miss this. But I... I, I didn't have these pains, but I was up close and personal when they were going on, okay? Sharp pain comes, and then there's a respite. 
It's like, oh, it's calm. And then a few minutes later, somewhere way back over in here or something. And then, that's it. And then, come another one. And as that went along, the pains got longer. And the intervals of peace in between the pains got shorter. Until in the end, the baby is born in one long pain. I didn't miss it far, did I, ladies? Okay. The Bible says these things like that are going to come upon the earth like a woman in travail with these pains and respite. Pain and then some respite. But as we go along, the pain is going to get longer and the intervals of peace in between it is going to get shorter. Come the wave of COVID. Now listen. It's not had the effect it ought to have on the church. Listen, I lost friends and pastors to COVID. Buried them. Multiple ones. COVID's been devastating to some families. It's hurt those in nursing homes that you can't go see and funerals you couldn't have. and It's kept families apart. It's been a tough deal for a lot of people. It has. It's hurt. But by and large, we've not awakened to the spiritual problem. It hadn't got us where it ought to get us. It hadn't moved us. So let me just, just try, try to answer. Is your prayer life deeper? Are you more concerned spiritually? Or are you just sort of walking along here just sort of in a fog waiting for it to all end? Is your focus been on who's the president? What's happening to the stock market? See, where's your focus? What's happened to you spiritually? So by and large, most Americans, their Christian, their spiritual journey has not moved any. And so first wave didn't work. And another one's right on its heels. I don't know what it'll be. I don't know when it'll be, but it's coming. What should you do with the information? I mentioned last night seeking the Lord. It's impossible to seek the Lord without doing something spiritually. <laughs> you just can't do it. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you have to do something of faith. Let me put it that way. Something by faith, a decision by faith, whether it's pray, whether it's in the word. I, I, here's something you could do in the natural realm, but it's a decision of faith. You're going to give up your food and go feed somebody. You'll give up your money and go give it to somebody. I write a check and send it to Salvation Army. You go find, that's all right. Salvation Army, if you use that good, does good work. But the idea is to take your check down to somebody in need. And minister to them. Because Jesus said, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. He's down there hurting. He's down there broken. He's down there hungry. He's down there thirsty. But again, it's about the kingdom work. So there has to be some decisions in our life to reorder our life around spiritual things of faith, things of eternal things, instead of these temple things. And I can tell you, we, 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 okay. Y'all probably going to think the preacher backslid. So let me just tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bear my soul before you so to show you the kind of thing I'm talking about. We're so entangled into the world and the things of the world and what we got to keep up with. I mean, several of you got multiple cars like me. You got to keep up the tag. The oil's got to be changed. All that. You got your armors. You got to be fixed. And some of y'all got them zero turn things. And y'all got about three or four of this and that and the other. You got all that to take care of. And life is just so full of stuff that, man, you know, you got a little time for a little devotion, a little reading. And, man, I got to get on busy here. You know, these retired people say I'm busier now than when I was working. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You're just busier doing what you want to do now than you were when you was working. Or you wasn't working too good when you was working. I don't know which the case may be. <laughs> that might be it. I ain't sure. But yesterday, this is me. I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about. We just entangled. We got so much stuff. 
How many remember when you could get away from a phone? You didn't have no phone. Remember when you could go somewhere and nobody knew where you was? They couldn't find you either. And they wasn't saying, why ain't you answering your phone? Huh? These things are peppering us all the time. They got our attention. They're after our attention. The TV's after it. The internet's after it. The grandkids and all they're doing's after it. The life's full of this, that, and the other. And constantly this, 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 this. Every day we go to bed, something undone, something we could have done. Is that not our life? All the time. I'm out there praying. I'm out there seeking the Lord about what to say to y'all. Saturday afternoon, I watched a little bit of a golf tournament. I could care nothing about it too much, but I watched a little bit of it on Saturday afternoon with a wife on TV. Yesterday, where's the, where was I at in the motorhome? Out there? Is that where it was? Over there. Okay. I'm out there. That's a good hookup, by the way, out there for a motorhome. Y'all do good. But anyhow. I'm out there in that, and while I'm in the business of praying and doing that with the other thought comes to me, I, I could check the scores at the golf tournament. Now think about that for a minute. I know nothing like that don't ever happen to y'all. You're never in your prayer life or in your middle of the word, and you think of that dinner you had to cook and that thing you got to fix over there and the thing you got to do over there. Next thing you know, if we're not careful, our minds have got so much going on and so much in the temple. What happens is, is we order our life around that. God and his stuff get shoved to the back burner. Amen. Right. And we've got to reverse that. Amen. The real offer of Jesus when we get saved is to live for an eternal kingdom. Amen. The spiritual things and eternal things take priority over the temporal and natural. Every page of the gospel, every page, not some of them, but every page, is stressing that his people to live like him are going to emphasize eternal things over the temple. Yes, sir. And our influence is gone Amen. because we've become just like the temple world pursuing its stuff with our time and our energies and our effort. And we have no distinctive of the power of God because we're not appropriating and focused where we ought to be focused. The Lord helped me preach. Let's all do this tonight. Let's all go home and between now and the time, this preacher and everybody in here, ask the Lord how we need to order our life. What needs to adjust? What needs to change? See, because we're all a little different here. Y'all ever know saying how pretty I am? Y'all, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, even my mother don't think that. But anyhow, all right. But ask the Lord how our life needs to order. Some of you got responsibility for other people. You got issues you got in your life, old or younger, you're taking care of them. You got people maybe work for you and other things, and you can't have a fire sale about stuff, you know, and, and, and I got that. But we're all too much entangled in the temple. And there's some prying loose from that with our affections, with our time that needs to be spent more in the kingdom. And about the kingdom things. And only when we do that are we going to regain the power and the influence that we ought to have in this nation. We've got to get out of this world and get back to living for our kingdom to come. Amen. All right. I may try a little. I got more to say, but we're going to quit there. That's all we can swallow. Stand up and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, sort through this tonight. I know you help me. Now help the people receive what you have for them. Lord, not one thing of me may they remember. Keep it from them, Father, in Jesus' name. Everything of you, don't let them forget, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, show us how to, it applies to us personally how that's to affect us, our families, our decisions, our choices, our affections. Show us, Lord. Don't let us to get away from it. Help us to re-preach it to us. I know it's your word. I know it's your heart. Help us to see it. So that, Lord, we might be affected by this correctly. That we might be corrected. Your, your goal was to, to, to get us corrected. You said, if I do these things, 
if we humble, pray, seek your face, turn from our wicked ways. In other words, adjust. You'll forgive and heal. So Lord, help us to be healed. Now Lord, we thank you. I thank you for these that have come out. Keep them in the rain. Keep them safe. And Lord, help us tomorrow night to prepare us and bring us back and encourage and strengthen and heal and help us, we pray. We love you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. I'm done. See you tomorrow night. You're dismissed. <laughs>